The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each weekend on the show, we discuss talks from the most recent general conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and hopefully have a bit of fun. I'm your host, Matthew Watkins, and today we'll be discussing Elder Garrett W. Gong's address from the October 23-23 conference, Love is Spoken Here. And for this episode, because Elder Gong talked so much about callings and leadership and so many relevant things, I invited my friend Kurt Frankum from the Leading Saints podcast and Leading Saints organization to come join us for this episode. A quick intro for everyone who doesn't know Kurt, Leading Saints is a fantastic resource for really any calling you have in the church, even if you're in between callings, it is a fantastic resource. I can't recommend it highly enough. I love when I was Elders Corn President going onto your Elders Corn President page mm. and listening to interviews with other Elders Corn Presidents talking about how they lead, even stake presidents talking about the process of, of administering in the Melchizedek priesthood. It's just, it's just been absolutely fantastic. You don't shy away from some of the controversial stuff around LGBTQ issues, which tends to capture the news a lot. And yeah. But also you go into just, you know, how to issue a call and everything. It, it's so wonderful. Cool. Well, yeah, it's always interesting to hear what the other guy is doing, right? And in in, it has a similar calling. And so we just, whether they're right or wrong or the, the same tactics work for you, it's just fun to see how other people are managing the same questions and, and you know, callings that, that we all are. Thanks for having me. I love uh, geeking out on anything that it's tangential to leadership. So this is great. Well, and this is great because we're talking about the geekiest apostle, which is how he starts his talk. <laughs> so we right. got, I've, I'm the general conference nerd and the software nerd. You're geeking out. I definitely appreciated the nerdy aspect of this talk. My wife did too, <laughs> when he uh, starts by talking about a locket that he gave to his wife, where he inscribed Morse code for the letters I, I, U, and in the middle I is a Chinese reference that the letter I in Chinese, that character, I guess, means love. And so he said, this is double encoded message. That has got to be the nerdiest thing I've ever heard in general conference. He's such a romantic. <laughs> my wife looked at me and she said, oh my gosh, he's you. And they let him up there to talk about it. <laughs> nice. Well, good. Everybody should have an apostle they relate to a little bit more, you know? So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see the nerdiness. Yeah. And, 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 he, and he mentions AI later on in the talk, you know? Well, what was the part? Maybe I forgot here. When did he mention AI? It's near, it's during his third principle, it says generative artificial intelligence at the very end, like one of the last paragraphs. It starts with generative artificial intelligence has made great strides in language translation. Long ago are the days when the computer might translate the idiomatic phrase, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak as the wine is good, but the meat is spoiled. <laughs> so anyways, it, yeah, a little reference there. I, I have to wonder if they do use a little bit of chat GPT when they're writing their talks. You know, it was, I believe, I don't know if it was a BYU devotional, BYU-Idaho devotional, but recently Elder Gong, you can find this on YouTube. I subscribed to, you know, all the church colleges and their devotional pages. And he spoke, I'm pretty sure, maybe it was BYU. And he, he talked about AI and, and you know, he, he went through different things like, I typed this into chat GPT. I, I think that's the one he referenced and this is what it got back. And so, yeah, I think he's sat down and like many of us had and played around with this new technology. Well, we saw the folks at Mormon or they have a, an LDS. Yes, LDS bot. Too, LDS bot. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. That's a lot uh, of fun. It's, I wouldn't use it. I, I've gone in there and it's, it's made up some scriptures sometimes. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, that's the truth. Like, don't take, you don't assume anything. Cause I think I asked a question like, I needed, I was like, give me, Give me the 10 most popular scriptures about, you know, such and such topic. And it get, gave me one. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to go to my gospel library and I'm going to mark it. Uh -huh. And I'm like, Wait, <laughs> that's not the scripture. Like, where does, he, where does this even come from? So, and they're, they're tweaking. I think they're, they're aware of these things and hopefully they'll refine it. But yeah, you got to, it's fun to a point, but don't, you know, don't prepare your, your elder score and relief study lesson off of it. So. <laughs> I asked it the age old question of like, how do you satisfy the Jacob to Enos? gap of years like 
are they like 90 years old and having kids? Like, how is it that Enos is like 180 years after Lehi left Jerusalem and he's just his grandson? And it invented new genealogies. <laughs> and it was like, well, in Enos chapter two, you see this one. I don't know, Enos chapter two, what are you talking right. about? But it sounded very convincing. <laughs> yeah. I think it does everything it can not to say, I don't know, before, you know, it'll even lie to you before it says, uh, I don't, I don't have that. So, <laughs> it's funny. So, nerdiness aside, he, he talks about, you know, the gospel language is warmth and reverence. And he goes and sharing some great insights about that, about children expressing love for their parents. Something that stuck out to me as a parent and as a sometimes ungrateful child is his experiences of hearing these children share appreciation for the parents and their parents crying because maybe that thank you is not audibly expressed so often in the home. Yeah. You know, it is in the home where we first experience love, right? And that's the foundation of love, of that home love that we build and understand the love that we're receiving from a divine parent, right? And so, I, and I love the, just the sweet nature of this. And I think in general, like just stepping back, not only is Elder Gong may be a nerd like us, but just the, he's so soft-spoken in a way of like, if if the, the Holy Ghost voice literally sounded like Elder Gong, I, I would not be surprised, right? Just the the tone that, that he delivers his remarks, you know, it's a different love than maybe like an Elder Hall in love, or I guess we say President <laughs> Hall in love, but it's, you know, he's just such a, he's got such a sweet tone. So, the fact that he is, you know, has a talk called Love is Spoken Here is just so fitting for Elder Gong. And I love, I love this line here. We said, sometimes we need to know the love spoken here is heard and appreciated here. Mm -hmm. My family, we had an experience a little while ago. You remember the new Grinch movie that came out with Benedict Cumberbatch? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, the, I, I really love it. It's, it's a lot more wholesome than the Jim Carrey one. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> you know, the mom of Cindy Lou, who is just, she's a single mom. She's overworked. She's really sacrificing to try and make things work. And my kids watched that movie and when they picked up the messages, they went to my wife and gave her a big hug. Oh, cool. And just like Cindy Luca, they said, we want to do something nice because we realize you're having our time. That movie kind of helps us realize how stressful being a parent can be. And I don't know, it's a little plug-in for some good media there. Yeah. We need to know that love spoken here is heard and appreciated here. For sure. And I, the the tenderness of it all, the says, you know, we we use reverent language or I'm sorry, we use reverent prayer language when we address Heavenly Father and and warm respect when we speak with each other. Uh, so, I think this is, because he talks about this is one of three, you know, love languages of the gospel that he he addresses during this talk. And and this is a good, fa just that foundational one of love is warm and it's it's reverent. And as we talk with our, our Father in Heaven, you know, that, that, that uh, warmth and reverence should be present and obvious. As President Hinckley said, our prayers should not be like putting up a grocery list. That's right. That's right. One piece that jumped out to me in that paragraph was he said, our sacrament and other meetings focus on Jesus Christ. And immediately my mind went to a BYU devotional by one Thomas Griffith, who you recently had on your show. Yeah, so he talked about the time he was a stake president of a BYU stake back in the early 2000s. And he had one charge for his entire stake that he, you know, discussed with his bishops that he presided over. And that was regardless of any meeting that we have in the church or whether it's Sunday school, elders quorum, sacrament meeting, the atonement of Jesus Christ will be the focus of that meeting. And if you cannot tie the topic of the, the meeting to the atonement of Jesus Christ, then don't talk about it, right? And he said it really shifted the culture of his stake and made Jesus Christ the center, his rightful place of, of the gospel, of that, of that experience that people had coming week to week to church. They experienced Jesus Christ. And so, it was a phenomenal, you know, anecdote of how, how this is done. What I really liked that, that I didn't necessarily get from his BYU devotional, but I got from your interview with him was the softer side of it. And like, okay, so what about those topics that you just, you can't really find an, a decent way to, to tie this into the atonement of Jesus Christ? And he said, well, that's what firesides are for. <laughs> that's right. right. That's what family home evening lessons. That, we have all these other fora that we do not take advantage of that aren't sacrament meeting, that aren't that precious two or three hours a day where we get to gather as saints and speak one with another concerning the welfare of our souls, to quote Alma. Yeah, it's a powerful principle for sure. And on that note, Elder Gong says, as we recognize Jesus Christ at the heart of the of temple covenants, we refer less to going to the temple 
and more to coming to Jesus Christ in the house of the Lord. Each covenant whispers, love is spoken here. And again, I love that reframing of the temple experience isn't about going to the temple as if, you know, just similar how we, we, we sometimes speak of the atonement. It's not the atonement. It's the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's the temple of Jesus Christ. When we go there, we're coming unto Jesus Christ, not just, you know, going in and doing, you know, wrote uh, covenants and, and rites and, of the gospel. It is a, a, an experience that binds us to Jesus Christ. That's something that I'm trying to work on in, in my family is insisting, hey, it's time to get dressed to go to church. Yeah. Right? Okay, it's a chore now, right? When you word it that way, it's a chore. But when you say, okay, let's go worship the Savior. Let's go partake of the sacrament and renew our covenant. It's like, okay, that, that's a little bit more motivating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I love his jokes here where he talks about new members and church vocabulary. And that, that was always a pain point for me on the mission. Yeah. We chuckled the thought that steakhouse could mean a nice beef dinner. Ward building could be a hospital. Opening exercises could invite us to do head, shoulders, knees, and toes in the church parking lot. I had a, a new convert on my mission as their probably their their fourth week in fourth week in, in church. We said, "Oh no, you come over here. This is where gospel principles class is. That's where where new members and investigators go." And they said, "Investigators? What's well, the church under investigation for? What's going on here?" <laughs> we said, uh, yeah. No, until last week, you were an investigator. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then that the next paragraph after that, I love how he sort of goes from a lighthearted, you know, talking about our different language from a steakhouse to a ward building to opening exercises, and then really hits us with a, a, a powerful gospel perspective. And he says, the words we use can draw us closer to or distance us from our other Christian, from other Christians and friends. Sometimes we speak of missionary work, temple work, humanitarian and welfare work in ways that that may cause others to think we believe we work on our own. Let us always speak with warm and reverent gratitude for God's work and glory and the merits, mercy, and grace of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. So again, like we, we use this word work a lot, but there's only one work that fulfilled all all demands of justice, you know, all expectations in, in eternity. And that's the work that Christ did through the atonement. And that's somewhere that Culturally, we often fall short as Latter-day Saints, right? And the whole grace versus works thing that, that ignites a firestorm in debate. Yeah. We, maybe we don't emphasize the grace aspect of it enough. Maybe we don't emphasize God enough in just the way that we speak about it, even though theologically, we certainly reverence and revere Jesus Christ. It's so easy to revert to, okay, let's focus though on our checklist. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Another piece he brought up that can be an impediment to not even interfaith dialogue, but sometimes could be a turnoff for new members. He told the story of a recent convert who was told her skirts were too short. Instead of taking offense, she replied, in effect, my heart is converted. Please be patient as my skirts catch up. In today's culture, it seems like we're being pulled into two diametrically opposite poles at the you know, pure legalistic end of things. And then also in the pure, you sometimes hear it as personal authority or whatever end of things where it's just like, oh, justify whatever. And Satan kind of wins at either extreme, right? But here, her statement is really great. She acknowledges that there is an ideal we're striving for. There's no self-justification, but there's also a pleading for patience as she struggles with an outwardly visible situation she's in, whereas we may be struggling with inwardly visible things. And to both teach with clarity and with charity. I really like that balance he gave. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, you know, just to be patient with those that, you know, it's sometimes the gospel lifestyle comes easy to those that have been in the gospel life all their life, right? And, yeah, because your uh, closet's already full of modest clothes. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, it's probably a little pr pricey for some people to, to transition to a new life or, you know, when you relied on old habits and, and, you know, clothing. And so, just as we're patient with them, I think that's a, it's a beautiful message. That's wonderful. Now, he gets to the second language of service and sacrifice is the second gospel language. Now, this was the part that really hit me more than anything else. What were your impressions on it? Yeah, you know, the, just that first paragraph there says, as we gather again at church each week to honor and rejoice in the Sabbath day, we can express our sacramental covenant commitment to Jesus Christ and each other through our church callings, fellowship, sociality, and service. So I'll ask, I'll 
put you on the spot here, Matthew, and ask you these questions. So, you're, so you were just released as Elder Scorn President. So, do you have a calling now? I am the branch clerk in our local Spanish branch, newly formed. Awesome. And if you were to pick any calling, you know, what would it be? Oh, favorite calling? I'd pick Ward Mission Leader in a heartbeat, man. <laughs> oh, cool. I love it. All right. Now, what about fellowship? How do you, like, if someone's to ask you, how do you prefer to be fellowshipped, in, you know, in the church experience? What, how would you respond to that? <sighs> That's tricky. See, I'm not much of an interpersonal kind of person. I I love the doctrine. I love the teachings. I don't, res- like, it doesn't matter that much to me how many people shake my hand, for example, whereas to maybe my wife and others, I know that that is their gospel love language, right? Fellowship carries this huge weight with them. <laughs> and so, you got to be careful to make sure that you minister to people in the love language that they need. And so, are you a in-home ministering guy or do you prefer a good conversation in the hallway at church? So, I, I like what the handbook says that says you talk to your ministering families okay, and you determine what level and method of contact they prefer most. Yes. Which goes again, like I said, speak to everyone in the love language that they speak minister to them in the way they want to be ministered. I have I have had some families that are very reclusive. They will text you all day long, but showing up at their home, especially unannounced, would be a massive mistake. Yeah. yeah. And other families that, hey, yeah, swing by whenever you're in the neighborhood. <laughs> and then what about uh, sociality, which th- that's a word I don't use or I, or I frame it differently, right? Like, But as far as you being social and the church, I mean, it's somewhat connected to fellowship, but anything... Like what what do you what social aspects of your church experience do you appreciate? During the last few years, we have watched political polarization explode in the church. Would you agree? Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's not that it's not that people were always, you know, in line politically before. It's that all of a sudden people were wearing almost visible symbols of their political identification at times or not wearing symbols of their political identification and all of a sudden everyone's more outward and expressive about their political identification. And it makes it harder to find fellowship with the saints outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why that connecting point needs to be so much stronger. There were members of the church that I didn't know hold opposing viewpoints of mine that all of a sudden were diametrically opposed. But on Sundays, like we seriously, we feel that camaraderie and that friendship that transcends all of that. And that is so precious to me. Yeah, yeah. And then what about service? What's your ideal type of, of service? Do you, do you like helping someone move? I want to go to the cannery, just rake the leaves in the widow's yard. I mean, what comes to mind? Oh, anything. We do a we, we do cleanups in cemeteries and there's a very historic neighborhood and it's hmm. this, this treasure in our town, but it does get run down sometimes. And we love meeting together as a ward, just going house to house and saying, hey, look, Everything here is overgrown. We've got trees that have fallen down from the most recent storm. Let's haul that out of here for you. Yeah. And getting that area pristine is, is such a wonderful blessing because a lot of them, they, they're not in a situation where you can do that for themselves. They've been living in the house for 60 years and they're just at the age and, and situation in life where that's not feasible for them. Yeah. And I appreciate entertaining my questions there, but I, those four words, it just makes you think like, obviously, Elder Gong, just like anybody that speaks at General Conference they put a lot of time in this, a lot of thought, right? They don't just put four words down just because, right? They've thought about these words and and in, in the context. And I love that, you know, he says, we can express our sacramental covenant commitment. I mean, talk about three powerful words right there, with sacramental covenant commitment to Jesus Christ and each other's through our church callings, fellowships, sociality, and service. So, it's just just those, I sort of had to sit with those words for a minute and, and ponder myself, like, what, you know, how do I express, you know, my sacramental covenant commitment through those, those four words? It's a powerful thought. Well, it's so easy to divorce those two, right? You, you say, oh, yeah. I've got the ordinance. I've got the saving ordinance. That's the most important critical thing, which is true. That doesn't mean that the rest of it is fluff, though. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then he goes on that next paragraph. He says, when I ask local church leaders what concerns them, both brothers and sisters say some of our members are not accepting church callings. That, that's one thing, like, just that, that surprises many, like, just surprised me of being put in bishoprics and, and serving as bishop and whatnot, just how many people just say, no, I can't, I'm not going to accept the calling, you know? And and I get it. I mean, there's there's different seasons of life and times where it would be, you know, you, you really have to pray about it. It would be appropriate for you to say, no, I can't do that right now. And that's something we thought about as a family and 
you know, you may not know about A, B, and C going on in my life and whatnot, but it's interesting that Elder Gong is is using a chunk of his, his talk here to address this because I think that's a message of, of, I think in 2023, being engaged in a ward is much different than maybe 1985 being engaged in a ward there. There's different there's different distractions. There's it seems like family life is is busy. Or I don't know. I was only a few years old in, in the eighties, but you know, I think it, that our culture has shifted. That church callings sometimes are perceived differently than they were decades ago. I'd like to get your your opinions because you've been in stake presidencies. You've been in bishoprics. Mm-hmm. One of my buddies here in Tennessee, he said that he says it's about three to one for every three callings he extends, mm. one gets accepted. Is that about the ratio you've seen historically? I, you know, that probably sounds about right. And just my gut feeling of it all with my, uh, you know, reflecting back on that experience. And, you know, I've, and those that do reject it, you know, good, I would say majority of them have a really decent reason, you know, whether it's schooling or they're about to move or, you know, they have a, a troubled teen that they're really focused on and can't, can't deal with that. But, and that's the balance. And later on, he said, Elder Gong says, when Sister Gong and I were married, Elder David B. Hate counseled, always hold a calling in the church, especially when life is busy, you need to feel the Lord's love for those you serve and for you as you serve. And that's the, these are like the nuanced experiences you have with callings is that you're, it opens, it sort of breaks your heart open for other people that you serve, but also is encouraging for when you feel the the sustaining power that God is, is giving you as you show up and, and do your best in those callings. Now, I'd like to clarify a little bit on something you said when we talk about those who reject. Mm-hmm. Elder Uchtdorf, he said, In the Church of Jesus Christ, we do not seek nor do we decline callings that come from God through inspired priesthood channels. President Oaks, just as service and callings is not sought, it is not turned down. Applying this rule, thy will be done, not mine, in our lives can mean never to turn down an opportunity to serve in building the kingdom when asked by one in authority. And then there's dozens more mm-hmm. of Prophets and apostles saying, we don't turn down callings. And I've seen this debate raging every once in a while on Latter-day Saint Twitter and stuff. Like, is it appropriate to turn down callings? And I think of the guidance I was given by my branch president, this is probably 2013. And he asked this question to us in the branch presidency after he had interviewed a member for a calling. He said, brethren, is it appropriate to decline callings? And we're like, well, well, yeah. I mean, if you're about to move or something's going on. He said, no, we do not decline callings, but we do in form of circumstance. (laughs) <laughs> if yeah. you're about to move out of the ward in two months, that is an important piece of information that you will want to communicate to your priesthood leaders when they issue a call, but you don't flat out say no. You say, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to serve as elder quorum president if you feel so inclined. Just be aware, I'm not going to be here in two months. So, yeah, if that changes your mind on this, great. If not, I will serve for as long as you need me to do. And, and I, I think his approach talking about that where Again, Satan wins if we go to two, either extreme. If we go like the pure prophetic bishop infallibility model where every single thing he says, you know, just take it and, and don't question it and just, you know, go straight for it. And, you know, every single call represents the will of God for you at this exact moment with no questions asked. And then at the other end of the extreme where we're like, well, I'll just wait till something I think is important comes along. <laughs> yeah. Something that's something that works for me. Yeah. I really love this story from Robert C. Gay. He said he was called to be a mission president by an apostle, and he brought into this his excuse. The result, he declined the call. The apostle extending the call did not miss a beat and replied, you really don't get it, Robert. You're either going to live your life by covenant or convenience. There is never a convenient time to serve. This is a matter of faith. You either believe that the Lord will bless your life with the blessings you need as you do his priorities, or you don't. And so, I, I have I have so much sympathy for people who you know, their bishop aren't, is not aware of the struggles they're facing at home. And that should be communicated and that should be brought before the bishop and say, hey, this calling, I, I don't like the idea of it. It sounds scary. And here's what's going on in my life that you may not be aware of. And, and, and the bishop should say, yeah, I understand that, but this is a calling from the Lord and we are asking you to fill it. And they say, okay, you know, this is time to put my faith to the test, I guess. Yeah. I often give the advice to leaders that are extending callings, you know, they get this process, you know, on the leader side, they've maybe been in a meeting or two where they've counseled over this and prayed about it and, and considered different things. And then we give it to, we extend it to the member and they have, you know, a, a second or two to consider it and say yes or no. Sometimes I, 
oftentimes extending these callings, I would give them a heads up and not necessarily need an answer right then. I'd invite them to go home, pray about it, kind of go through their own journey that we as a bishopric or a stake presidency had the the benefit of going through, and then invite them to come back and say, all right, where are you at? Like, what do you think? What concerns came up? What what should we consider? How can we adjust this to make this a successful and, and a blessing for you and your family? And, and to receive confirmation, for sure. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's these, these little ways we can go about it to to really make this a beneficial, positive experience for as we extend calling. One other suggestion I would have for anyone in a leadership position, and again, this is maybe stepping onto your podcast territory a bit here. That's all right. Don't be afraid to state your authority. And when you know the call is coming from the Lord, let the person you're calling know they're coming from the Lord. I, I feel like sometimes our default assumption with our jovial, friendly, you know, easy to talk to bishop is that uh, this is his idea. And, and sometimes, sometimes it is. Sometimes I've been in places where the word counts is like, oh, you know who'd be good for this calling? That person, let's do that. Right? And the decision is made, maybe not necessarily with the most revelation and prayer involved. Mm-hmm. I really love this story from President Packer, actually relating a story from Elder Spencer W. Kimball. When President Kimball was a stake president in Arizona, he went to the bank to call a man to be the young men's leader in the stake. And he just casually went up and he said, Jack, how would you like to be the leader of the young men in the stake? And Jack said, Spencer, you don't mean me. I couldn't do anything like that. <laughs> and he tried to per- persuade him, but Jack refused the call. And he went back to his office, just like, what did I do wrong here? I know the stake presidency have been inspired to make this call to this man. Finally, it came to him. I've made this horrible mistake. I know why Jack wouldn't respond. So he called him on the phone and he said, Jack, I got to apologize. Last Sunday, the stake presidency carefully prayed, considered who should lead the young men in the stake. There were several names. Yours was among them, and we all felt that you were the man. We knelt in prayer, and the Lord confirmed to the three of us by revelation that you were called to be in that position. And he said, as a servant of the Lord, I am here to deliver that call. (laughs) Jack said, well, Spencer, if you're going to put it that way, and President Kimball says, I am putting it that way. (laughs) That's great. I love that. That's awesome. He wouldn't respond to a call from President Spencer, but he would respond to a call from the Lord. And having that trust in knowing that his call came from Heavenly Father was critical to him. Yeah. There were many times as bishop I would uh, share with people that they were not my first choice for this calling, that I walked into a meeting with a name in mind that this was the person. And the more we talked about it and counseled about it, we were guided a different direction. And that was, I'm not like, I'm not trying to offend you or that you're not my first choice, but we felt guided to you as for this calling, you know? And so again, like you mentioned, it sort of brings the, you, you sort of give them a peek behind the curtain of as far as how we got here. You weren't just a name on the board that we plugged in. Like we were very prayerful about this and, and felt confirmation and guided to your name to fill this role. And that will empower people. Uh, and one last quote in that section there that that was a mic drop moment was, he said, the Lord's restored church can be an incubator for a Zion community. I think that's such a great, like, broader vision of why we do these callings, why we do service, why we come together as a community, because we're we're stepping into the incubator of a Zion community, because that's the, I think that's the long-term goal, is to be a Zion community and, you know, usher in the return of our Savior. And that, I, so, I love that that line. I have to share this fantastic story related to that. Like you said, it is a Zion community. Our callings in the church, sometimes it's very easy to feel like they maybe are a bit of a waste of time or it's just to fill a position, Mm. but they carry a weight and an importance that is very preparatory to us. I was reading over President Eyring's biography just a few days ago, and he was the BYU, I, or at the time, Rick's College president at the time the Teton Dam broke in Idaho. And he watched as a community, some people just jumped up and went to work helped other peoples with their houses for days before even checking on their own. It was touching the selfless sacrifice and service that the members were giving, while others just kind of disappeared and had nothing to do with anything and retreated out into the bushes. Mm. And he was confused why there was such a diametric difference. And so, he did a study. His biographer actually said it was a scientifically significant study. And President Eyring, speaking about the difference that they identified between those who rose up and those who ran away, said, there was just one difference. Those who were heroes had been people who always remembered and kept the promises in the little things. 
the daily things, a promise to stay after church dinner to clean up, or to come to work on a Saturday project to help a neighbor. Those who deserted their families when it was hard had often deserted their obligations when it wasn't so tough. They had a pattern of failing to keep their word to do little things when the sacrifice to them would have been slight, and doing what they said they would do would have been easy. But when the price was high, they could not pay it. It was almost chilling to me to realize these spiritual muscles that were flexing in seemingly small ways, yeah, right? These little commitments to go help take the kids to fast offerings or to come clean the church building or to accept a calling that we're not super enthused about. Those spiritual muscles, we are going to need them to do the hard things. And if we can't do, be faithful in a few things, the Lord's not going to put us, he's not going to give us the large things to do. I've heard some members that even less active, and Elder Bednar has spoken about this in his talks, Many of the less actives that we go and minister, they have strong, powerful testimonies of the reality of the restoration, of the divinity of Jesus Christ. And sometimes members and less active members may think, well, if the prophet were to ask me to go to Zion, I'd go. Or if the prophet were asked me to do some great thing, I would do it. You know, he calls me as, as Ellscorn president, I'll step right up, right? He calls it a bishopric, I'll do that. But nursery, eh, building coordinator, eh. <laughs> Yeah. And sometimes we, as Elder Ruchtor says, we either seek a cave or we seek a crown and neither neither attitude is very healthy. Yeah, for sure. Did you want to move on to the part that talks about ward activities? Is that all right? Yes. So he says, for some time I have felt that in many places in the church, a few more ward activities, of course, planned and implemented with gospel purpose, could knit us together with even greater belonging and unity. One inspired ward activity chair and committee uh, nurtures individuals and a community of saints. Their well-planned activities help everyone feel valued, included, and invite, invited to play a needed role. Such activities bridge ages and backgrounds, create lasting memories, and can be carried out with little or no cost. Enjoyable gospel activities also invite neighbors, also invite neighbors and friends. And I, so I just love, I think, again, there's another you know, we talked earlier on just about that brotherhood and elders quorum and, and bringing men together. This is the, the word activity dynamic has maybe gone a little stale at times. I think I remember in the, the late 80s, early 90s, we hit, you know, the, the ward road shows. You know, that's an old term that's that's died out. But the ward athletics. Yeah, the athletics it was a much bigger thing, right? To see the ward come together that even it wasn't directly related to a gospel theme or whatever, but it was a community. It nurtured the community in a way that when we showed up on church on Sunday, we were we were friends. We were connected. We were ready to sit down and dig into the gospel and share testimony and and bless each other's lives that way. And so I love this, you know, just these these random, not so random encouragements we find in in general conference talks of saying, "Hey, let's uh, re." regroup about the whole ward activity thing and how are we doing there and could we knit our hearts together a little bit better by having more activities? This is the first time I can ever remember from the pulpit them asking for more ward activities. I feel like right, yeah. at least all my life, it's been simplify and reduce. Yep. Simplify Less and meetings, reduce. Simplify right? And reduce. Let's go from three hours to two hours. Let's get the block into one thing. Let's, let's, let's minimize any distractions from family time, that sacred family time. And to the point where it's like, we start to feel guilty about having meetings. And I, I don't know if this, if you've seen this in your area, I feel like there's been a post-COVID malaise across the church. Mm, yeah, absolutely. That we had all these activities and then we came back and everyone's back and we're going full throttle on the sacrament meeting, but we're still only doing like two ward activities a year. Yeah. Like, what's up with that? And I think our homes, generally speaking, have become a very comfortable place, right? And where we have all the entertainment, you know, even the... You look at just the economy in general, the the whole the whole like movie theater industry sort of suffering because you got great movies at home that you can watch on a streaming service or, you know, you got activities with the family or people are distracted with their phones and, and they can kind of numb out just by sitting and doing nothing where I think there's some more opportunity to invite people out of their home that has become more and more comfortable, you know, which I don't necessarily mind. So. <laughs> We, we need more activities. And he says gospel focused. And I would take this as the opposite of what Thomas Griffith talked about is, yeah, everything should be gospel focused, but it doesn't always have to be preachy. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Together. But it seems like, that, you know, out of these three gospel love languages, the first one sort of focused more at home. The second one was more of a church and community. And this third one was more about our, that love we feel from God through temples, through 
those covenants we make, you know, because he calls it the gospel language of covenant belonging. And he talks about living in a self-centered world and Jesus Christ offers a better way. Relationships founded on divine covenants, stronger than the cords of death. Covenants, covenant belonging with God and each other can heal and sanctify our most cherished relationships. And I've so much appreciated this extra emphasis, especially during the administration of, of President Nelson, of, of the, you know, the covenant path, the co- what covenants offer to us, that the importance of temples and why we need more and more and more temples because it binds us to God. And this really, out of any Christian denomination, this doctrine really sets us apart from so many of, of, the, of the idea of covenants and inviting us to step into a relationship with God by making a covenant and the power and strength we feel from these covenants we make really is a, a unique doctrine that that we set as paramount to a lot of this. So, no, this is this has been great. And I, I of course, love Elder Gong's remarks and perspective. And it was fun to, to dive in a little bit further today. So, yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, the, the calling debate will continue. That's great, right. But hopefully this, this helps with a little bit of that. And. And thank you so much for for joining us. It's always nice having you on. Yeah, love to be here, and I hope I get invited back. Oh, you will, 100% guarantee. Okay. (laughs) Thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. This episode, we discuss Elder Gong's address, Love is Spoken Here. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and everywhere you get podcasts. You can find links to all our podcast platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org. If you want to follow me, Matthew Watkins, you can find me at powerinthebook.com or on Twitter at Joyful Repenter. And big thanks to our podcast guest, Kurt Franken, for joining us today. You can follow him at leadingsaints.org. And again, go subscribe to his podcast. Everybody in the church needs a resource like this to assist them in their callings. There's the handbook, there's the Holy Ghost, and then there's the Leading Saints podcast in third place, but it's a close it's a third place there. <laughs> But remember, while we always appreciate new followers, it's better to follow the prophets and apostles themselves. Remember, although we love speaking about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions, for the which we invite you to tune in next week on the Conference Talk Podcast. (music) 